which I think is is the problem that I think a lot of people are facing right now with using uh, AI for their skill set for like their main job is like, you know, presumably you're good at your main job. Welcome to Needlestack, the podcast for professional online research. I'm Shannon Reagan. And I'm Aubrey Byron. Today, we're wrapping up our discussion on AI and OSINT by looking at the meta state of affairs and some tips and precautions for using it in your research. Yes, it's been a great discussion with our recent guests. Shout out to Chris Poulter, Neil Spencer, Trent Lewis, and Declan Treesice. Uh, wonderful discussions with all of them. Uh, we really enjoyed having them on. And I think we've learned a lot along the way. And I think what we want to talk about today is kind of the perspective that uh, hopefully our listeners have kind of come to as well. Uh, and we've learned in these discussions. So to kind of color the conversation, we also wanted to bring in some new material as well. Um, there have been a couple of great articles on uh, AI and OSINT recently, both in terms of some use cases in OSINT that it can be used for, specifically in geolocation, uh, and then also in the fraudster, cyber criminal, scammer field, um, and how the prevalence of LLMs and being able to clone and use them for purposes for good or ill uh, is just going to be the way of the world in the future. So should we start with the the wired? Should we start with the ill? <laughs> <laughs> the ill. Uh, yeah, I think wired put out a great article summarizing some research about things like fraud GPT and some of these uh, AIs, worm GPT is another one that are already mm -hmm. coming out that are going to assist scammers, particularly low level phishing scammers who maybe probably weren't that good at their <laughs> jobs, I guess you would call it before. Um, <laughs> it's just gonna up the skills of everybody. The phishing emails are going to be better. They're going to be, yeah. um, more accurate looking Coming all the time and less suspicious looking and everyone just it, from security teams to users need to be on the lookout for that kind of thing. I think, you know, they, in the article, they covered these two, you know, one is predominantly for phishing. One was uh, touting that it was for creating quote, undetectable malware, uh, finding vulnerabilities and assisting with, with scams as well. Um, but I think this is just, a window into the future that the article was also good to point out. That's like, there's no telling if these are actually legitimate. Like if you decide, you know, as the uh, lowly cyber criminal that you are or scammer that you're going to hand over your money for this, like that you're going to get anything in return, the dark web and uh, marketplaces like this are full of illegitimate products and services, just trying to scam the scammers. So buyer beware to scammers. Uh, this might not be an actual thing. Scamming scammers. What a moral conundrum. <laughs> what do I do? Um, if these two aren't legitimate, like there will be ones that are um, the number of LLMs that is just going to come out. I think, you know, when this when ChatGPT first came on the scene, it was like, oh, like, what is this one thing? And it's like, oh, no, what is this universe of things that is going to change the way we communicate and produce content and produce anything really it's just huge you know this right reminds me a uh, callback to episode 17 in season one with uh eileen ormsby talking about the uh hitman services on the dark oh, web yeah. that are really just scamming people out of their money because why yeah. would they go do that <laughs> <laughs> seems very dangerous just give me your money and, and i'll run away yeah but you know for, you know, these two are, again, touting a specific service for phishing or, or malware or whatnot. Um, but that AI can be used for anything that you want to. I think the the main, one of the main lessons that have, has come out of these discussions with AI experts in OSINT is we're just really going to have to start doubting everything, which just feels so horrible to say. And, you know, the issue of truth has been up for discussion a lot in recent years. But this is such a game changer um, for people that it's your job to collect and verify information. So in, on one hand, OSINters will be really good at doing this. 
Um, but on the other hand, it just makes their job that much more difficult because what you assume, you know, could be reliable information just has that much more possibility of being manipulated. Well, speaking of reliability, um, another article that came out recently from Bellingcat tested Bing and Bard for geolocation to see if these, you know, AIs chats can um, geolocate an image specifically without EXIF data because most mm -hmm. OSINT researchers, when they're finding an image, if, if you have EXIF data, bam, <laughs> the job is done. You have geolocated that image. <laughs> unless it's, yeah. Unless it's been manipulated, you, you did it. Um, so yeah. particularly when the image has no EXIF data, and that is the coordinate that is in the metadata of an image. Yeah, uh, it's a really detailed article. And I think one of the nice things that it does is, you know, there's so much black boxing in AI uh, is that through the screenshots that are shared of, you know, the responses, particularly that Bing gives, um, that it is much better at walking through like, here's how I arrived at this conclusion. So, you know, you could kind of go back and like either replicate those, you know, uh, steps on your own to verify that information. Um, or distrust, you know, maybe a stuff that's like, oh, that's not what I would do. But it seemed pretty, pretty basic, essentially, because as the researcher points out, um, Bing is essentially teaching itself from the internet, you know, and articles and, and 10 step programs and things like that of how to be, you know, a geolocator, that it's learning just the way a novice would, um, but also presenting its information in a very, um, authoritative way. Bing also does a good job, though, of saying, like, you know, the, the credibility of this one is low. Like, I can't, I'm not going to tell you for sure, like, this is where it is, but this is where I think it is. So that was really interesting, the way that it broke down um, the inner workings of what's going on in the AI, and then the commentary on the findings as well. Yeah, I think the other interesting part for me is that part of the problem with trying to do this exercise is the same problem for getting anything out of uh, ChatGPT or the other current AI chat is it takes excessive prompting um, yeah. to get the results that you're looking for. And like, even in this case, when the writer told it that there was not EXIF data, it hallucinated some at first, and then he had yeah. to say, no, that's not correct. And then go back and then but I find it interesting that on one of the tests, he did several, um, mm -hmm. it managed to get, it gave them coordinates for the results and they weren't correct, but they were close. <laughs> it got yeah. kind of part of the way there. Yeah. And that was a lot of it that, you know, he was saying it was finding things that because of the other like information that it's it's looking at on the internet or from the uh, the you know language that it was built from, uh, that he's like it would reference things that weren't in the photo but were nearby because it's understanding certain things about the image in the context of all this other information. So it it can get you close in that sense, like if you just have no idea like where in the world like this could be. It's like oh maybe this is in Edmonton or Ottawa were the examples in the. Um, in the article, um, but for you know an OSINT researcher, close is not necessarily good enough. Um, you're trying to look for you know this this street, um, this person, uh, this shop, you know whatever. Uh, that yeah, close is not great. Yeah, and to you know be skeptical and verify the results that it gives you because probably you're going to get several errors back, at least for now. And I think, um, you know, his conclusion at the end of that article is using an AI chatbot is inadvisable right now for geolocation. But I think right. one of the big asterisks there, as with so many things in AI, is right now because this technology mm -hmm. is going to continue to approve. And in the near distant future, it might be more worth it. And I think the other yeah. aspect too is just how much time are you using to prompt a chatbot to get inaccurate results that you could be using to just go geolocate the image yourself. Yeah. And right now that's probably um, a scale that's tipped a little too far one way. Yeah, you could definitely sense a, a degree of pain in the researchers writing. It's like, I asked it to do this and then it did this, like get a load of this thing. 
Um, which I think is is the problem that I think a lot of people are facing right now with using uh, AI for their skill set, for like their main job. It's like, you know, presumably you're good at your main job and AI is strange at, you know, your the thing that is your niche. Um, so if you're really good at it, like asking it to do simple tasks, it's like, well, I didn't really need you to do that. Like I can do that in a second, you know. Um, and then asking it to do things that you're not good at, it's hard to verify then because you don't have the, you know, background knowledge to know if you can trust certain things or not. So it's in a, it, like I said, it's in a weird spot right now. Um, but as you said, lightning speed, like where we will be at the end of the year with this, like if the same article was written in December of 2023, it would just be interesting to see how much better it's gotten. Like we've seen the change with like ChatGPT 3, 3.5, like the enormous strides that it has done in like these rigorous tests um, between those versions. And it is just leveling up at frightening speeds. Right. We're in the dial up era of ChatGPT and yeah. make no mistake that there will be a fiber connection in the future. <laughs> By the way, the articles that we mentioned are by Matt Burgess and Dennis Covtoon, respectively. You know, I was thinking when when you were saying about the, you know, when will we get to fiber, um, that just trying to gain perspective on this, I think because it's it's new and it's very disruptive, that people have a lot of feelings around using AI or not using AI and, and how good it is at, at what we're asking it to do. And to be able to look at this like in the long line of technological history that has disrupted, but in the end benefited OSINT. Um, like OSINT came out of more non-OSINT, of, of like clandestine activities in, in the government and spy agencies and things like that, using newspaper and media and like open source information nonetheless. And then you get the internet. Like, I cannot imagine how frustrating it would have been for like a career, you know, CIA guy sitting at his desk in 92 and being like, we're going to connect you to the internet and you're going to need to start using it all the time. Like, oh, I mean, he probably had it in like 89 or something to be fair. But there is that just like, oh, do I really, is this oh, really dear. something that I have to start, <laughs> yeah, that I have to start mastering and very quickly, um, the internet, this, you know, search engine aspect of the internet, social media, like, again, if you told that same guy, like, I'm, I'm really going to need you to get on Facebook, I'm really going to need you now to get on TikTok and Discord, and you know, all these other things that you just have to keep constantly learning, and learning is difficult. So, you know, I understand the the pushback, but now is the time to at least start getting comfortable with like speaking to these things in terms of learning prompt writing, you know, learning how and when to start distrusting uh, the output that it, gi it gives you versus like bake this into your, your everyday workflows. Like now is at least the time to start experimenting and adopting because it's, it is going to get baked into everything very soon. Absolutely. This has been my public service announcement. <laughs> I will say too, we all know that we need to verify the results that it gives us. If you have not been using ChatGPT, um, I think the vigilance with which you need to verify, I think the hallucinations, when I had heard about hallucinations, I was expecting was the sky is red, not blue, or mm -hmm. something slightly more interpretive. But I was asking it to summarize articles to see if it could uh, around OSINT. And one of them, it made up a division of the People's Liberation Army in China, made up a division, a name for it, an event that happened with this division that does not exist, and a year from the article <laughs> that I tried to get it to read to me. And then this does not exist. Um, none of the pieces of what it made up. And when I asked it where it got the information, it told me paragraph two reread it and said, no, that's not there. And, mm -hmm. you know, just back and forth. But I, I think the creativity to which it makes stuff up may take you by <laughs> surprise. Um, yeah. So definitely yeah. vigilance is needed. This came up in the Bellingcat article as well, that one of the, during one of the tests, um, I think it says it runs a reverse image search and it's like, oh, I found it on Flickr here and here's a link. 
And so it makes up a URL and he's like, it's nothing like this is it. It's a 404 page. He looks in the way back machine like it's it's nothing. You just made up a page or at the very least, like if this is somehow some, you know, uh, artifact from, you know, the Internet long ago, um, I can't verify that. I can't. This is, it doesn't help me in my grand search. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to see the shape that hallucinations, hallucinations take place, not just in like spouting claims, but providing resources and events and links and things like that. It's just weird. Yeah, because it may not know the answer, but it does know what a URL looks like and can provide <laughs> you with one. Yeah, sure. Here you go. So, yeah. And then, of course, the other thing is anything with perspective, there are built in biases that you need to consider in your research as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Trent Lewis's episode um, focused a lot on that, you know, just thinking about the way that these things were built and like all in technology, it, it inherits some of the traits of the builders. And so um, how does that affect outputs, um, certain people that it might target, especially, um, or just that it doesn't understand, like doesn't have as much data to analyze certain groups of people as well. Um, so it's not necessarily malicious, um, but can still be wildly unhelpful. Absolutely. So I think beyond, you know, be skeptical of everything it gives you. Another thing to consider is that a purpose-built AI, like some of the things that Babel Street is coming out with, or, you know, Navigator or, um, or Puritech, something like that, that is built for OSINT. And <laughs> that was the purpose of its development is going to be a lot better than chatbots. Yeah. Or if you have the ability to work with a data scientist and create your own LLM for your own data sets, like that is a way to really like trim down on the risk of hallucinations because it it's not searching, you know, the entire history of, of the internet. Not to mention the security aspect there that you're not feeding yeah. your data to a program that you don't know what it will do with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's kind of, yeah, the last recommendation. Um, and we talk about this a lot and it seems maybe um, irrelevant, but it's very similar, I feel like, to our recommendations on using the dark web. We mm -hmm. recommend you do use the dark web for open source investigations. We have a whole series on that and we have a lot on our website. But one of the most important parts of that is that you should have a policy um, yeah. with your employer of how you're going to use it, the legality, how you're going to audit how you use it. Everything mm -hmm. with that applies here and you need an AI access policy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, you know, like centers for excellence within companies, you know, building best practices of like when to use, how to use, how to verify, like, you know, building that, you know, educational base um, is huge as this as this takes off the ground. And people want to be able to harness it, but they want to be able to harness it successfully and not mess up. Absolutely. All right. Well, maybe we can stop talking about AI for a while, but I just, I highly, highly doubt it. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at least on this podcast, right. maybe. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to spare you. Well, thanks for listening today as we wrap up our series on AI and OSINT. If you liked what you heard, you can view transcripts and other episode info on our website, authenticate.com slash needlestack. That's authentic with the number eight.com slash needlestack. And be sure to let us know your thoughts on Twitter at needlestackpod and to like and subscribe wherever you are listening today. We'll be back in September with more discussions, tips, and advice on open source research. Thank you. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.